This week we visit the Petronas Towers in Kuala Lumpur. Wander through the heart of ancient Rome. Stand in the shadow of Christ the Redeemer in Brazil. And take a peek into the future. But first... In the 1960s, this obscure back street was the place to be in swinging London. Mason's Yard in Mayfair was home to Indica Gallery, an arty hangout for the Beatles. Paul McCartney was a regular and John Lennon met Yoko Ono here. Now 40 years later, Indica has reopened. Barry Miles opened the first incarnation with John Dunbar in 1965. It embraced experimental art and the avant-garde. Paul McCartney, who was living on the top floor in the little attic room, and um, next door was Peter Asher's sort of wonderful L-shaped room, all done out in Norwegian wood and everything. And then there was this little maid's room with, with McCartney in a single bed. And um, so McCartney was intimately involved with, with the bookshop and the art gallery from, from day one. The reborn Indica has again embraced the spirit of the avant-garde and experimental art that is adventurous and often obscure. I just noticed the sound from downstairs and it gave the whole thing a very interesting soundtrack, I think. But the most famous story to emerge from the early Indica is that it was the birthplace of one of the 20th century's great love stories. John Lennon and Yoko Ono. Yoko was a conceptual artist in her own right, and the two met before the opening of her own exhibition. Lennon signed the visitor's book with the address of his mansion in Weybridge. It wasn't, in fact, the opening. It was the day before the private view, when we were still installing the, the show. So there were only six or seven people there, probably. And, um, but uh, Yoko very quickly, of course, uh, latched onto John and, and showed him around and uh, you know, explained what each piece was. And uh, John Lennon was a little suspicious of almost anything avant-garde in those days. I mean, until he got together with, with Yoko, he was always uh, very concerned that someone was trying to pull a fast one or you know, con him in some way. And uh, uh, so, you know, in fact, he, he famously once uh, said, avant-garde is French for bullshit. So uh, that, that was sort of his attitude. But I mean, he liked the, the whimsical side of, of Yoko's work and the, the obvious sort of Zen Cohen connections and stuff. I mean, it was, it was uh, had she not been Oriental, I think he might have been more suspicious, but he could see the cultural background of, of the work. So um, he really seemed to enjoy it. And uh, I only really remember it because, um, I mean, we were just putting up the show, and so uh, for, for John to show up was a bit of an interruption, really. And, uh, and Yoko was very keen on him, and um, they were having a very good conversation together. So when John was about to leave, she, in fact, uh, all tried to get into the car with him to, to drive off. But uh, I think Lennon had been up all night the night before or something, too tired. For Beatles fans, that night has been etched into history. Some familiar sights came out of it. This was Apple, a Yoko creation. Co-founder John Dunbar says the original Indica was in the right place at the right time. It was utterly different, yes. There was uh, nothing like it. They were, they were all rather intimidating, kind of Mayfair-type uh, suits, kind of not, not very inviting, and, uh, and certainly basically uh, rather you know, well-known artists of, of the 50s. Now there are many galleries dealing with this kind of many artists uh, making, making art which is not paintings on walls. And at that time there was very little else. So, um, you know, quite how direct the influence was or whether it was just in the air anyway, I mean, who's to tell? Lillian Lin is an artist who was with Indica in the early days and was one of the first exhibitors in the new century. It didn't last, but I think it, it was kind of like a cosmic flare, which is what this piece is called. You know, flares are bright and dynamic. Uh, they put out a lot of energy, but they don't last.
Welcome to the Patronus Twin Towers in Malaysia. It's a national icon which people just can't leave alone. Some want to race up it. Others see it as a leisurely stroll. It's 1,483 feet or 452 metres from the footpath to the top of the spire. For a while, the Patronus Towers were the tallest buildings in the world. The building attracts other activities. Jumping off the top is popular with some. The jumping is actually an organised event. Each New Year, there's an international base jumping championship. Base stands for building, antenna, span and earth. 54 skydivers jump from the 73rd floor, about 300 metres from the ground. Each participant executes the jump by leaping into a free fall for several seconds to clear the building, before deploying their manoeuvrable parachutes towards a target. The jumpers, from Europe, North America and some Malaysians, signed forms indemnifying the owners of the building in case of accidents. In most other countries, a waiver cannot protect owners from legal action, so divers leap at night and flee when they land. Uh, you have to have a great amount of skill. You also have to have a great amount of courage. And I think you have to have a free spirit that you are prepared to do something as extreme as this. Wherever you are in Kuala Lumpur, you cannot escape a view of the Patronus. The company which gave the towers their name, Malaysian National Petroleum, totally occupies Tower 1. Constructed between 1992 and 1998, the 88-storey Twin Towers are the pride of the fast-developing Malaysia, a symbol of its economic development. The base jumpers get a rare view of the city, and despite the risks, jumpers such as New Zealander Jason Fitzherbert, who has completed over 700 jumps, are grateful for the chance. We're allowed to jump them in Malaysia. Most countries, we're not allowed to jump the buildings. Well, our runners are within sight of the towers now. While Spider-Man has made his way up the building with just his arms and legs, He's also attracted some attention, some of it unwanted. Elaine Roberts first tried this stunt in 1997. Will he make it to the top this time? Many film and television viewers would be familiar with the Patronus Towers. It's been the location for films such as Sean Connery's Entrapment and The Amazing Race. It's beautiful, it's really beautiful, because um, you get to fly for four or five seconds. It's, it's really amazing. Um, back home, we don't have things this tall or this beautiful, so it's pretty neat to be here. But it's now firmly entrenched on the extreme sports map. I think I'm proud to say that we have actually put Malaysia on the world map for extreme sports through this championship. Well, after a weekend of jumping, running and climbing, it was time for those who took part to officially reap the benefits. Some were given prizes and a trophy with a check. Others reached the finish line. However, things didn't go so well for Spider-Man. Just as he was back in 1997, Elaine Roberts was grabbed by the long arm of the law on the 60th floor. He wasn't without his supporters, though. It is illegal, like I said, but it is his individual passion. This won't be the last we hear of Spider-Man Elaine Roberts in this series of landmarks. The Colosseum has long been the iconic symbol of Imperial Rome. An architectural wonder built at the peak of the Roman Empire in the first century AD, it's a structure that has come down to us with a mixed reputation. It was the world's most advanced sporting stadium in its time, a design that has become a blueprint for countless stadiums ever since. Around the time of Christ, Rome was the centre of a massive empire, a city of breathtaking art and architecture. The Colosseum took its place near the heart of the Roman seat of power. The name Colosseum 
has long been believed to be derived from a colossal statue of Nero nearby. But the Colosseum has a reputation for bread and circuses barbarism and brutal gladiatorial and hunting contests. Roman Emperor Trajan is said to have celebrated his victories in Darcia in 107 AD with contests involving 10,000 gladiators over the course of 123 days. Most ended in mutilation or death. Humans were not the only blood sport for the amusement of the masses. Exotic animals were hunted. Lions, hippos, elephants, giraffes, and even ostriches were slaughtered. Dio Cassius recounts that over 9,000 wild animals were killed during the inaugural games of the amphitheatre. These days, tourists can simulate the experience of gladiatorial contest through the help of 3D glasses, but the reality was no computer game. Completed in 80 AD, the Colosseum's original 50,000 seat capacity was expanded to over 80,000 in 354 AD. As in modern stadiums, your seat was determined by wealth and class or influence. The elliptical arena itself is 83 metres long by 48 metres across, and its surface is now long gone, revealing an elaborate underground structure called the Hippogeum. It consisted of a two-level subterranean network of tunnels and cages beneath the arena, where the gladiators and animals were held before contests began. Eighty vertical shafts provided instant access to the arena for caged animals and scenery pieces concealed underneath the arena. It is still yielding up secrets. Within sight of its familiar terraces, a human skeleton dating back to the 10th century BC was recently uncovered. The bones were found at an excavation under Caesar's Forum, part of the sprawling complex of the Imperial Forums in the centre of Rome. Archaeologists used their bare hands, small metal picks and soft brushes to painstakingly remove layers of dirt from around the 1.6 metre skeleton. It is a female individual, age of death, roughly on the basis of the field data we have at the moment, is between 30 and 40 years old. It is well preserved. At the moment, the morphological examination of the remains doesn't show that she had any particular diseases. The consumption of the teeth is quite evident. We don't see any relevant teeth problems. The Colosseum remained in use for nearly 500 years, but time, earthquakes and stone robbers have done to the Colosseum what many a conqueror couldn't, brought it to the brink of ruin. Restoration and clean-up efforts are regular and comprehensive. But the Colosseum's position in the heart of a thriving metropolis ensures tourism and pollution will take its toll on this icon of ancient Rome. It's Brazil's most famous icon, Cristo Redentor, the statue of Christ the Redeemer. For over 80 years, it has towered over Rio de Janeiro, the nation's capital. The 125-foot statue has stood upon Corcovado Mountain since its completion in 1931. It was built using donations from rich Brazilian Catholics and local engineer Ito da Silva Costa oversaw the construction using steel and soapstone. The landmark Art Deco style image of Jesus with his wide open arms embracing the skyline was chosen after much discussion over a rival design featuring a huge Christian cross with Jesus holding a globe. 
This monument was raised as an expression of the love and faith that we have for Christ, because he has given us so many beautiful things. It is the conjunction of divine architecture and human architecture. Rio Harbour was recently voted one of the seven new wonders of the world in a competition which drew more than 20 million votes worldwide. During the campaign, Brazilians didn't need much encouragement to show their pride in one of their best-known national symbols. It's a monument that stands for openness and uh, for welcoming. So I think it is a fantastic uh, monument. But reaching the top of the 700 meter tall Corcovado mountain has traditionally been a trial for even the fittest devotee. The 222 step climb was once called the penance, but all that changed recently with the installation of three escalators and elevators. A mass was held at the base of the 40 meter tall statue to bless the new devices. We bless the elevators and the escalators. The elevators are a blessing for the physically disabled, who until now virtually had no way of reaching the sacred statue, or being able to see the magnificent view. I believe that there are people like him, who were born in Rio and who had a dream of coming to the Christ statue for a long time. He hasn't been able to walk for about a year and a half, but he has a perfect mind and he was waiting for this inauguration. But not only the devout will benefit from the changes. Rio's tourism office believes the elevators and escalators could raise the number of tourists coming to the monument by 20%. That will take visitors' figures to over 800,000 people per annum. So far, their predictions seem accurate. Oh, it makes it easy. It's quicker, it's fast, it's convenient. In 2006, the statue's 75th birthday celebrations included cellist Anthony Landowiski, great-grandson of the statue's original designer, sculptor Paul Landowiski. It's a beautiful um, statue and uh, for me it's a very beautiful honour to play uh, and to represent my grand-grandfather here for this uh, birthday. It's a very big, uh, very big ceremony. It is hoped the recent improvements will encourage native Brazilians to visit one of their own national icons. So far, only 4% of visitors are locals. Those who do make the effort agree it's something special. It is really good. Everything is very peaceful here. There are a lot of festivities. When everyone gets together here, it is great. Landmarks are not just about the ancient or the monumental. They're also about the present and sometimes the future. This is the House of the Future, or at least one version of it, on display at the Belgium Living Tomorrow Convention. 80% of the technology in this house is already on the market. The rest is not far away. As you'd expect, energy-saving devices take a high priority. It is a fact that buildings are uh, consuming a lot of energy. More than 40% of total energy is used by buildings for climatization, for heating, for the lights. And that's why we have to build environment-friendly houses also. Not only this house, but every house is going to be built. And, uh, for example, we have integrated here photovoltaic cells on the lamellas to generate also electricity to, to, to use inside. The house uses fuel cell technology, which combines oxygen from the air and hydrogen from gas bottles. The electrochemical reaction produces electricity and heat, and the only waste produced is pure water. Designed by Zahar Hadid, an Iraqi-born British citizen who won the Pritzker Architecture Prize in 2004, the kitchen presents a main unit named the Z Island. Imagine. Here, a touch control panel allows you to switch on a multimedia screen, 
change the lighting. Release some pleasant aromas from three taps located next to the cooking surface or adapt the heat. When scanning a shopping bag on an electronic screen integrated in the kitchen wall, a TV cook appears on screen to help you step by step through the recipe. Meanwhile, you can easily check consumption of water, rainwater, gas or electricity inside the house. This gives an example of what you consume in the house from water and rainwater, gas consumption and electri uh, electricity consumption. So you can see here when you push the button here, so it will measure how many water you have consumed. And if it becomes red, you have consumed too much. So it's a kind of indication. So there, there will be a tap who is open in the house, so you have to check it. Another eye-catching innovation can be found in the children's bedroom with a prototype of the wellness cocoon. The cocoon responds to fears that energy will become expensive and scarce and offers an environment where temperature can be kept under control. The constant supply of oxygen creates a healthy space. For Liam Gray, a six-year-old visitor, the main attraction, however, is the cocoon's multimedia screen, though he fears his dad will not be able to afford the whole thing. Meanwhile, Liam's mother, Ailing O'Kane, enjoys the parents' bedroom. While she can see the benefit of the latest technologies, O'Kane says the house of the future cannot give her what she most craves, time. I'm afraid I won't have time to actually use all of the innovations, that's the only thing, because we won't have any more time in the future than we have now. But that would save time, to be able to watch the news or check the internet before you actually open the computer would save time, that would be great. The Living Tomorrow concept is a meeting place for innovative companies and other projects will be on display in Amsterdam and San Jose in the United States. Besides taking care of every mood and whim, this house has also been designed with security in mind. Security cameras are hidden throughout the rooms. Even if it can prove useful, especially to keep an eye on the children's bedroom, Lene de la Tower, a teacher, isn't so keen on the idea. Here, I don't really mind the cameras. If it was happening in my house, I wouldn't be so happy because I like my privacy. But here, I don't really mind. <laughs> but just because it's all high-tech doesn't mean that old-fashioned pleasures such as the warm glow of the fireplace need to disappear.